Great. Okay, guys, this is everything producers need to know about AB5 um, by sponsored by Wrapbook, us. Um, we have Lauren on, who's our director of payroll, and Cameron, who's a co-founder and the CMO. And I'll let Cameron kind of talk about what Wrapbook is for people who are just meeting us today. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Cameron. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders at Wrapbook, like AJ said. For those of you that don't know, Wrapbook is a software platform built really especially for media producers. So that's commercial productions, photo shoots, live events, really any sort of work where you're hiring lots of really skilled professionals to work together to create a, a media a media outcome. And so we have totally re-architected the process of onboarding, start work, time cards, union payments, all in a very easy to use and intuitive software platform. Um, I don't want to go too deep into a sales pitch. I want us to jump into AB5, but we have a lot of resources on our website, video demos, and we'd love to share with you what we've built. In addition, we have an insurance agency here at Wrapbook that covers general liability, workers comp, inland marine, which is the insurance term for your rented gear or your owned gear. And we'd love to help you with your insurance as well. Perfect. And with that, let's let's jump into it. And I'll pass this off to Lauren about what is AB5. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Lauren Downey. As AJ mentioned, I am the Senior Director of Payroll and Tax here with Wrapbook. Uh, pretty excited for, for you guys to join and for us to get into this conversation. I think it's it, it's a big deal and it, and it really impacts um, our world, if you will. So what's AB5 or as, as people refer to it as the gig worker bill? And I think that the way to talk about AB5 is first, let's understand what it impacts. Um, Go, you can go on to the next slide. So let's understand what is an employee and what's a contractor. And then we can start to talk about what it was that AB5 was introducing. So what's an employee? An employee is someone who a company hires to perform a service. They control the work that they do. They pay withholding income tax, social security, Medicare. At the end of the year, they're gonna issue them a W-2. On the other side of that is a contractor. The company does not do all of that. They don't withhold taxes. The employment and labor um, rules don't apply. The contractor will get a 1099 at the end of the year and they're gonna go ahead and pay self-employment taxes. So the timeline, what happened? So in, in September of 2019, um, California very, very quickly and frankly, without much thought, passed AB5 law into, it, AB5 into law. What they were really trying to do was think about Uber and Lyft and those types of drivers thinking that they should be, they should be regular employees and they shouldn't be contract workers. What they didn't take into consideration was all of the other industries that were going to be impacted by what they did. Within the year, they then introduced a new bill, 2257, which introduced some exemptions from AB5. And we'll talk about in a little while what the specifics of those were, because though, that's where they were realizing, hey, we, we've made such a big change. We didn't take other things into consideration. Now we need to start to rectify that. I think it's also fair to say that there's still ongoing conversation about AB5. It is still, um, I would say, a work in progress. And we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the things that they're still thinking that they need to update or change. Finally, in November of 2020, California voters approved proper, uh, I can't, can't say the word, uh, Proposition 2022, 20, which um, also allowed app-based Uber and drivers and DoorDash drivers the ability to be 1099. So kind of taking back some of what AB5 had originally agreed. So as we're, as we're talking about California AB5, was designed to regulate companies that hire gig workers in very large numbers, which isn't only Lyft and Uber, but again, that's exactly the, the audience that they thought that they were, um, that they were attacking, if you will. 
Um, and now what they've done is they've said, now you have to start looking at that three-prong test, that ABC test, um, in order to prove that an independent contractor is not a worker. And it's safe to say, I'll say it now, I'll probably say it another few times throughout this conversation, is that any time that you hire someone, they should be considered an employee unless proven otherwise using the tests and the uh, requirements that have now been, been given to us as well as some of the exemptions. So what's the ABC test? It's a three-pronged test that they have to use to classify their workers. And again, you are an employee unless proved otherwise. That three-pronged test was written by the US Department of Labor. So they get to decide ABC, uh, AB5 kind of sat on top of that and extended those laws. I think they would say that they didn't really make a change. They just made it more clear. Others would probably disagree with that. Thank you. So what's the ABC test or, or the, the first prong of the ABC test, which is the absence of control. And it's really important to just to determine who is controlling the work of that employer? Are they free from someone else telling them what time do they need to be on set, what work they're doing, how they perform their job, or anything else that's going to direct them in a way other than potentially just giving them some parameters to say, I need this job done. How are you going to get it done? When can you get when when can it be good, when can it be done by? The second part is is this the service performed outside of the usual business of the employer is it something totally separate and we want to bring someone in to perform this for us as that third party or and finally is it is it customarily is the individual or the worker is this their usual work that they do do they generally engage in independently established trade or profession, have they done this before or are you just the only person that they're doing it for? So how has it changed? I, I think everybody here would agree that there's, and specifically for California, what it did was 200 million people have been now reclassified as, as employees for wage and hour laws. Under the ABC test, any person that's providing labor needs to be a, an employee, not a contractor. This has become extremely expensive for, for people that um, have hired 1099 workers or uh, individual contractors in the past. They now have a much higher, um, they, it, it, it costs them a lot more, whether it be in taxes or having to follow standards or offering health insurance. So there's some upsides, right? It, lay, it, it created a level playing field for our gig workers. It meant that you can't just make someone a 1099 employee because you don't want to pay taxes, leaving them to pay their own self-employment tax. It kind of said, no, you really can't do that. They have to be workers and you have to offer them the same benefits that you would offer an employee. It also made it so that all of those employees would be entitled to a minimum wage. You can't decide for this project, I'm gonna pay you a certain amount of dollar without thinking about what the minimum wage would be in that particular state, as well as again, benefits and other perks that they would be getting. There's some downsides as well. Um, and I think some of the downsides um, whoops, there we go, is potential loss of flexibility for the workers as, as, as far as hours and things that you would have to ask or that they would be doing, right? You'd bet they'd have to be in your control. Um, and again, we talked a moment ago about the cost of, class, of reclassifying them, specifically when we talk about taxes and benefits and all the other things that you would have to supply to those types of workers. So here's an here's a, a just some thoughts on um, some of the um, some of the workers that are that are now being added with two, with 2257 that are now exempt or could be considered exempt depending on some other requirements and I'll and I'll say that the requirements for what this means what is a free what is a fine artist what is a freelance editor the requirements to determine that is vague. 
they haven't really given us those specifications. So that means it's still up to interpretation with how you're going to, to, to pay these people. Always saying that they're a worker first, but if they meet these requirements, if they perform as a freelance editor, and in this particular case, there's a little note on the bottom that I picked up from um, the actual bill for 2257, which said that you can put the ABC test aside for certain people if they've provided more than 35 content submissions to a single hiring entity. But that's really all that they've told us. Um, so it's going to be really important that you keep good notes. You have good, clear agreements in place, um, specifying exactly what it is that they're doing and, and how they're working for you. So why does it matter? It has a negative impact on production. Um, clearly, major studios to move forward, right? Unheart, but it really affects those independent filmmakers, all of the music video work or short films. Any production that's non-union um, has an impact on, oh, AB5 has an impact on because it's thrown all of these extra things into play that you have to think about. Certainly once you become a union shop, there's collective bargaining agreements that are gonna help you make some decisions and it's going to guide how you're doing business. Um, but it certainly is a big deal to producers um, who have worked in a particular way up until now or up until January of 2020, um, you've pretty much had to change everything that you're doing in the way that you're thinking about bringing on um, workers for your particular projects. So continued impact. Now you're required to pay workers, uh, pay them a compensation for each employee. Um, rates vary, 35, 4% of your wages have to be paid by you. Again, we're talking about taxes, Social Security, Medicare, um, unemployment taxes, um, and then adding you know, workers' compensation in, you're also talking about having to pay another 15% um, onto, uh, that, that, that really goes onto your budget, right? It reduces your budget by an additional amount other than just paying out for that 1099 worker. So what are some examples that we can talk about for non-union workers? Example one, somebody who could now be an employee, cinemato cinematographer not free from control and direction. They're called to a set at a specific time. They have to perform a, a specific function and you're guiding what they're doing and when. Those, those people could really be employees now, not a 1099 worker. Example two, someone who could remain a contractor could be a location scout. You set the parameters for that, that person and you tell them, what is it that your production is looking for? When do you need to have it by? You might even ask them for how many um, photos or locations that you might need for a particular uh, event or production that you're putting on. But you're not telling them what time they have to do their job. You're not telling them where they need to go or how long they need to spend. All you're doing is giving them a parameter and then they're coming back to you. And it's up to you to choose whether or not you'll use one of the locations that, that they've submitted. You could go with a number of others. You may hire multiple location scouts to do the same job and then choose the one that you want. And then in the final one is what's unclear, which quite frankly is a lot of them. Um, the, you know, Someone whose status is unclear, you could make an argument that they're an independent contractor. You can try and reason why they would meet all three. Um, but choosing it wrong is going to cost you. The, 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 the penalties for choosing wrong are pretty steep. Um, they could cost you quite a few thousand dollars, $5,000 or, or more um, if you choose wrong and, and, and the, you get audited um, by the IRS, which none of us would want. So who makes the ultimate determination? The court. But, but aside from the court, it's really the production company or the producer of the, of the actual production. It's not the worker who gets to decide. So if someone says, hey, I don't wanna be a, 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 an employee, I wanna be a 1099, or I don't wanna be a 1099, I wanna be an employee. They can't really make that decision, it's up to you. And then hopefully you make the right decision along with the rules and regulations that have been given to you. So how do you avoid particular penalties? First and foremost, 
consult with a labor attorney. It's the best way. Um, a labor attorney will know the ins and outs of AB5 and anything else that comes into play and as new legislation is passed. And again, we've talked about it. Always assume that a worker is a W-2 unless you can prove it otherwise. Um, yes, they're more costly production. They're more costly to the production, but ultimately they're gonna save you a lot of time in, in uh, legal and tax expense. So retroactively, and this one, this one can be pretty difficult to think about. So in January of 2021, um, the Supreme Court said that the ABT, ABC test for determining worker classification goes back retroactively. Why would they do that? The real reason that they were doing that was because when they really wanted Lyft, we're back to Lyft and Uber, they really wanted them to go back in time and pay for five years worth of taxes that they were not, where they were not classifying their workers as employees. So in the first five years, they were only saying, nope, we're all, they're all 1099 employees. We don't really know for any other industry if five years is the time frame or what they're looking for us to do. Um, we know that we, we should continue to keep good records. There is more legislation still to go through, um, but the guideline that was originally set was five years. That's what we know. I think it's important also, I, I, I didn't mention it, but in order to protect yourselves and protect yourselves personally from any kind of, um, from any audit is create an LLC. This way you're not held personally responsible for anything that might come from an audit. So common questions and we've, you know, we receive a lot of them. Um, feel free to chime in if you have any. Um, does AB5 follow you if a California resident shoots in a different state? This one's a little difficult to respond because it's going to really depend on the amount of time that you spend in another state. So California has a funny rule and it says if you only spend a short amount of time, if you live and work in California and you spend only a short amount of time in another state performing or doing some sort of a shoot, then you, can, then you would continue to abide by California rules, which includes AB5. If you're on a longer running production and you're out of the state working, living while you're doing that, you would follow the rules of the other state. Next. So how much could it cost you? I made mention earlier, this one could really cost a lot of money. Violations could be upwards of $5,000. It could be upwards of $10,000 if the IRS comes back and just, or if California comes back and decides that you're a repeated offender. Um, so it, it, it could be quite costly for you. What are the AB5 exemptions? So there, there's quite a few. Uh, of the exemptions. Uh, I think that we showed some on the other screen. Um, it started out that the exemptions were really limited to accountants, attorneys, dentists, doctors, hairstylists, insurance agents, real estate agents, things like that. But I think once 2257 came into play, it, it really extended those to to be more, I guess, friendly to this industry where it included things like, um, I'm just, there you go. Fine artists, freelance editors, writers, musicians involved in certain in, in certain ways, like sound recording and music uh, musical compositions, or single record engagements and live performances. Producers, still photographers, translators. I would say again that it's that there is not much given to us that specifies what qualifies a worker that they're performing those jobs, other than to say that there's some requirement with the number of um, the, the number of content submissions that maybe a writer would give. So it would be up to you to decide, or is that person really a fine artist? Is that person really a freelance editor? It's still up to interpretation. That kind of takes us to our Q&A. Lauren, I think that that was, we kind of got through that kind of quickly. I, I realized yeah. they kind of powered through it. But the one thing I do want to stress as well is that and Lauren, you said this is that really, you know, these decisions, who makes these decisions is up to you and, and your attorney. Like, you know, this is just a purely informational, you know, webinar. Like we're not, we're not advising you, you know, on, on any of this. We're just giving you information and things that helpful information we, we know that can help you make the best 
possible choice for yourself, but always, you know, consult your own lawyer. This is meant to be purely uh, educational. But I also was going to say, Lauren, one thing about the ABC test that I think is really kind of hard for producers to wrap their head around is the second part, which is that the business of the contractor has to be outside the usual course of business of the, the hiring entity, right? Mm -hmm. And that can be tricky when it's like, how can you justify that someone on a film set is not outside of the usual, you know, course of business of the producer, which is to make produce, to, to make, you know, content. Yeah, it's tricky. Yeah, it's very, very tricky. And it really, I think, comes down to some agreement mm -hmm. that you have um, with with the person that you're working in. Some of it you're not going to know. You're going to have to go by what they're telling you and you're going to have to fit what you know into those tests and come away with it with the best answer that you can. Again, it's up to interpretation in many, many cases um, until more clarification is given. Um, but you really do need to meet all three of the requirements that are given. You can't meet one and say, okay, I'm good to go. And you also have to make sure that you're thinking about it from the perspective of the legislators, not what you really want the answer to be, unfortunately. I wanted to add something really quickly as well. And that is, so this impacted me very um, intimately. So before joining Rapbook uh, and, and working on this business, I was an executive producer of a production company. And like a lot of production companies in California, in the very earliest days, we were really unaware of worker classification laws, just generally. And so the easiest form of hiring a person is you hire a contractor. And so in our early years, we just did contractors all of the time. And as we started moving up market and starting to get to know film cast and crew, they educated us, this was before AB5 was passed, that, hey, actually, because you're setting a call sheet, you're setting a location, you're oftentimes providing film gear that's been rented, we really fall into this worker category. And there's actually a tremendous amount of precedent set by film unions and, and, and labor experts in California and all around the US that film workers are actually supposed to be classified as employees. And so all of these payroll businesses, that is what Rapbook is, is an entertainment payroll business, exist for facilitating this compliance burden, right? So now you know what AB5 is, as it is in California, what the heck are you going to do about it? And for me, as a producer, when I learned about this liability I was housing as an owner of a business, I was like, okay, I guess I have to go work with an entertainment payroll company. And what was so painful in the process was not just the added expense, because that was mandated, we had to do it, it's the law in order to stay compliant. It was all of the paperwork for the startup. It was the calculations of the time cards. As most of you will know, if you've ever run a production, most of your cast and crew are going to say, hey, what's my day rate? Well, there's really no such thing as a day rate. It has to be an hourly rate. And so mm -hmm. that day rate needs to then be divided by the time worked to get to an hourly rate that matches the day rate. And while that math is not especially difficult, it is difficult once you start doing it times 50 people on a set, people like leaving set at different times, overtime calculations, and then don't even get us started on union calculations, right? And so that's really what Rapbook is about. Rapbook enables you as a producer to deal with this added complexity of AB5 using software to take what is a very tedious, challenging experience and to make it at least as delightful as we can through automation and through software. And because we're doing it with, with software, you get all of these just awesome other software features that make your productions more efficient and effective. Um, I see that there's some questions here. Lauren and AJ, I'll let you take those on, but I hope that, uh, that that's helpful. And we'd love to give you, all of you here, a demo of Rapbook if you're not currently using it to show you how it can make your productions and your production operations a lot better. I should leave with one note, you know, this, this issue with AB5 is, it's near and dear to the hearts of many of our clients who are trying to navigate what they can do and how they can solve this in their day-to-day -day lives and, and the pain that it causes. And we'd love to, we'd love to talk with you about it. And uh, we hope you enjoyed this webinar. Yeah, thanks Cameron. Um, one other thing I think I'll mention is 
uh, actually a couple of things. As we're going through the questions, we'll answer them to the best of our ability. Um, if any of the questions are really more specific in nature, we may ask that we take it offline. We'll either come back to you with it or we'll um, have you reach out to us directly. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you, AJ, for bringing up the, the slide. So you can reach out to us directly. We're happy to have um, a conversation with you. Um, we're probably going to keep it a bit more higher level or general, but we're happy to discuss the, any, any specifics. Definitely. With that said, I'll, I'll start pulling up some questions. Um, okay, first one up is, uh, could you clarify the rec uh, you talked about creating an LLC to protect an individual producer. Can you just clarify some of the benefits of why an LLC is like, it could be good for a producer? Yeah, so what it does for the most part, it removes you personally from being responsible. So should you have an audit and it comes back that maybe you potentially paid a person um, incorrectly under the wrong, um, you paid them as an employee, uh, as a 1099 instead of an employee, and you have to fix it. There are gonna be penalties and things like that involved. You won't personally be responsible for those penalties. It'll be the responsibility of the LLC, and then you'll work out however you need to pay it or, or manage it through the company, not you personally. Sweet. Um, another question, this is a very specific one, so maybe this needs to go offline, but how does AB5 affect talent agencies that represent artists? Talent agencies used to be able to bill on behalf of their clients, um, but wouldn't this make the agent the official employer? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because AB5 or 2257 does not specifically call out talent agencies. Um, so I think you have to go right, you have to go through the same requirements as everyone else in order to make those decisions as to how they're going to be paid. As far as being the employer of record, I don't think that that's the case, um, but I probably would need to have a deeper conversation to figure that out. Yep. Um, here's one, um, having to do 35 previous jobs with employer. So if I hire a still photographer, they can only remain 1099 if we have worked with them 35 times before the specific job or if they have done 35 photography jobs in general. So a good question there about like this exemption that specifically calls out the 35 time submission. Yeah, and the wording exactly is, and I pulled it up because I saw the question come up. So I'm actually, so I'm just gonna go ahead and read it. It says that they have provided more than 35 content submissions to a single hiring entity. That's the extent of what they say. So I, I, I don't think it, I think it could be 35 overall if you're a company and you have multiple projects and you tend to work with the same person and they've submitted to you at least 35 submissions, then they would, then they would be exempt from that ABC test. It's kludgy. Go ahead, Cameron. Based off of the question from Dylan here, uh, I would say that it's very, it would be very smart to assume that these jobs, these workers should be classified as workers. Like the way that the statement is articulated mm -hmm. in the exemption, you have to think about it as like somebody submitting a photo to a blog for a company or somebody submitting some content to a business's like content strategy or Instagram. It's not as related to jobs. So if you are employing people bringing them onto a set where they are producing content, it would be very much in your interest to classify them as a worker, even at the expense of the taxes and, and rights that those workers have, because the penalties are so much higher. Yeah. Um, what's interesting, I wanted to point out one thing too, to the question regarding the LLC. You know, LLCs, there's three major mechanisms for business owners to protect themselves that we use contemporarily, you've got contracts, right? Like you can write a contract with your clients that indemnifies or shields you from li some liabilities that you may uh, engage with by the very nature of doing work for them. You can purchase insurance, general liability, Inland Marine, workers comp, that shields your business from liabilities that could arise doing work. And then the third thing is what uh, Lauren mentioned, which is an LLC or a corporation that shields you from debts that shields you from all types of liabilities so that your own personal assets will be affected. As it relates to payroll taxes though, as it relates to like messing this up, 
you may that may be able to pierce the corporate veil and the state can actually go after your own assets to to make that right um again we're not lawyers here but there is a precedent on this and i've looked into this uh pretty in intensely in the past so you really want to get worker classification right because the penalties are so steep and the classic modes of protecting your own personal assets they're not they're they're not as applicable here the the state takes this very very seriously yeah thank you cameron um, let's now go to the next one. How many other states does this law impact? Well, AB5 is California law. Other, other, there's about 11 or 12 other states that have some variation of rules that align with the IRS ABC test. For the states that don't align, they go by the IRS ABC test. But for this specifically, AB5 is, is California. And on that note, if you go to, uh, just go to Google and type in worker classification test, we actually have a post up on our blog that goes through every single state and tells you what test they actually use. So if you're curious about that, I can drop that in the chat as well. Um, but for instance, like, you know, Rhode Island is ABC, but then you might have Pennsylvania, which only uses prong like A and C of the ABC test, but not B. So yeah, definitely check that out. It's kind of a comprehensive guide to that question, um, especially yep. if you're looking to move your production from state to state. Um, Oh, we got another question. Um, regarding this, the California resident working out of state, how long is short-term versus longer where the worker should still have to abide by California law? Yeah, it, again, another one of those questions where it's completely vague um, and up to interpretation, but you're probably wanting to think about no more than a week. Um, if they're going to be out for more than a week, so it's a quick shoot. It's your onset, your offset, and you moved on. It's not any type of a longer project. So I, I would say sticking within a week, you're probably safe. And again, if you have a specific question about production you're planning to shoot, definitely reach out to us at contact yeah. and we can talk to you. Um, this one we kind of just touched on, is this only for California only? Like Lauren said, yeah. California uses the ABC test, but there's many other states that do. So um, yeah, primarily this is about California. <laughs> um, let's see, is an extra background an employee or independent contract? What is an actor classified as? Uh, well, do, you'll have to go through the test and figure out which way, how do they fit? Do, you, do they have to report at a certain amount of time? Are you guiding what they're doing and how they're doing it? Um, if those are the cases, chances are they're an employee. And again, you're always going to want to think that you're, that the people coming to set are employees unless you can prove them otherwise. A uh, question from Johnny uh, asks, is there any current legislation in process that will reverse this? And yeah, could potentially like reverse this, which would change the ruling and affect, you know, indie productions differently. Yeah, there's been a lot of conversation. There's a lot of things that are going on. I don't have the specifics of what bills that might be with California right now, but I do know that there is still a lot going on because people are pretty unhappy in lobbying to, to have this, to have more amendments done. You know, it is pretty interesting. You know, this law was mainly motivated by the gig workers at Lyft and Uber. And yeah. under the California proposition system, it was its main intent was essentially not as it was overturned. I mean, Uber, Lyft drivers, DoorDashers are now still classified as contractors. So pretty interesting to see how that rolled out. Yeah, and I think it's because they, again, and we kind of stated it in the beginning, in California will say, oh, we haven't made a change. What we did was, is we've just clarified what was always there. Exactly. Here's a great one. Can you restate the ABCs? I, I'll go, let's go back and let's let's go over yeah. the ABCs. Um, let's go back to what the ABCs are. Here we go. Yeah, so absence of control. And that this one is a pretty big one, right? So are you guiding what the employee is doing or the worker is doing? Are you in control of how they're performing their job? As an example, AJ, we were talking the other day, if you, have, you hire a painter that comes to your house and you tell him, I want my room to be blue. 
that doesn't mean he's a worker just because you've given him a parameter. But if you're telling him, I want you here between the hours of this and that, I want you to use these tools, I want you to paint it in a certain way, I want you to use a W stroke instead of an up and down, whatever it is, then you now you've crossed over to make him a, a, an employee. The second one, is this the usual business of the worker? Is it not just a one-off yet you're, you're hiring him for as a 1099 and it's not what he usually does? And then finally, is this is what they're, you're asking him to do outside of your business? Is it something that you're not usually engaged in doing? You're hire, going back to kind of that painter I wouldn't normally go ahead and paint the house. I'm gonna hire someone, come in, get it done. Tell me how long it's gonna take you. Maybe I'll move out while you do it. Cool. Um, another question, questions keep coming, which is great. I'm gonna answer this one really quickly. Are you going to share recording this webinar? Yes. So by signing up for this webinar, we'll be sure to email you guys the link to the recording. We also, if you go to wrapbook.com slash events, we have plenty, a catalog of many other webinars that we have recordings of that might be interesting to you from like nap getting the client relationship to other compliance questions. So definitely check it out. Um, the next specific question is, does AB5 apply to small theater productions, 50 or less seats with actors making a small stipend, something like a fringe festival with individuals producing their own pieces, maybe small companies, people not being paid over $600. Again, not specifically exempted. So I would say that you really need to look at the workers that are coming in and decide how, how they're going to be performing their, their services. And something else there is, I see the question, that this question kind of asks a lot about, um, is this, does the amount of money I'm paying the people change their classification? And the answer from the ABC test is no, it's, it's not. It's, it's, it's not, it doesn't affect it. Well, and actually, if you do have to make them workers, it could change what you pay them because now you must pay the minimum wage for the hours that they're there. So while they're still a 1099, um, no, but that could change. Um, but again, they're not specifically exempted. So they, they, you need to run them through the test. This is a, ref, uh, a flip of the question we had earlier. So we talked about, about, a, about a lot about California residents going to other states and what happens to the AB5 test there. What about, a, what about a production that's coming from out of state and shooting in California? I would think that if they are out of state shooting in California for a length of time and the entire production is being done in California, then you're going to have to abide by California rules, which would include AB5. Um, Here's one for crew members who are repped by an agent or typically paid on invoice through that agent, um, particularly still photographers, art department, you know, hair and makeup. Do we apply the ABC test to the reps company or the crew member? Does it even apply? Should the rep be asking those questions and paying people accordingly? So question here, a breakdown of who's on the hook for AB5 across the chain of like talent agencies. Yeah, so similar to what we were talking about before, we have to make sure that we're looking at what the employee is going, or what the worker is going to be doing. With talent agencies, it can get a little kludgy, and we probably, this seems to be a really specific example, and maybe it's someone that we'd want to have a conversation with. Cool. Does hair and makeup, can hair and makeup be 1099, or do they need to be a W-2? Kind of a common theme with these roles, you know, it depends on what they do depends on what they do and what you're requiring them to do. Do they need to be on set at a particular time? Will, they, will you be telling them, okay, you need to handle these five people every single day. You're gonna be here for the length of the shoot. They're probably workers. Here's one about, oh, sorry to make that off, Lauren. Nope, uh, that's it. This is one, um, if you're using companies like Fiverr or Upwork for freelance writers, editors, would our production company be the employer or would Fiverr Upwork be the employer? This is a very interesting question, especially as it applies to new media. So I can actually answer this one. Um, Upwork has actually introduced a payroll solution where they act as the intermediary staffing agency because there is not a lot of wiggle room for classifying a contractor as, or con classifying an employee as a contractor if they're not. So these same rules apply and Fiverr and Upwork are attempting to create solutions to handle this problem. Um, and you can transfer your risk on this 
on the penalties associated with misclassification by actually using Upwork payroll to, to pay Upworkers uh, according to US Department of Labor laws. Um, again, the same things apply. If it's an employee, the work is probably ongoing and could be terminated at will. Um, do you set a location and a schedule? Do you tell them how to perform the work in what order and with what tools? So all of the same rules apply. Uh, and I just, I, Lauren, of course, could have answered this as well. I'm sorry for jumping in, but no, I'm no, fascinated ahead. with seeing how Fiverr and Upwork are actually attempting to um, facilitate that very question. That's great. That was awesome. Thank you. I wish I could say we planted that question, but no, that was, that was organic. Um, what about makeup artists? This is a very specific question about a role, but a photographer who hires makeup artists, he gives them a sense of what he wants the model to look like, but doesn't know about, but doesn't know anything about makeup himself to tell them exactly how to accomplish it. They'd use their own tools, but they are provided a call time. This is like really, I mean, Lauren, you can take this one, but it seems like this is one where like, we can't really tell you what decision to make. It's, we can give you the information, but you have to make it and it's better safe than sorry, right? Yeah. Yeah, and, and again, it's kind of the answer that I gave on a couple of the others, unfortunately, is that makeup artists are not specifically um, exempted. So you do need to run them through the test and really look to see if they meet all three of those requirements. I know it's not a great answer, but it's the one that we have. Yeah, in fact, oftentimes they're not. Yeah. Uh, and the way that makeup artists are able to get themselves compensated for like their makeup kits, even though they're bringing their own tools, they actually ask for a kit fee, which is different than the labor. It's a 1099 as a rental to your company as right. additional income to that makeup artist. Again, a very shameless plug for Wrapbook. We also do <laughs> enable uh, kit fees, reimbursements in a very, very easy to use software tool let us give you a demo of it. Um, I hope that that answers your, your question, Christopher. Here's one for Meredith. Um, why are producers potentially exempt? I actually have a little bit of insight on this one, but if you guys want to take it. No, go ahead. I'd like to hear. No. <laughs> I don't actually oh, know the answer no. of why. <laughs> so, so typically producers, you know, have a company, right? That they, they get, they get a contract to go make the shoot. They bid on it, they get the bid and they decide to go make it. Um, the, cl the client isn't directing them into like, you know, who they need to hire, how they're going to get it done. The same way you hire a painter and say, I want you to paint my house, but they don't tell you how much crew to use or what you're going to use or what type of equipment you're going to use to get the shots. So that's one reason why producers are, well, typically producers have LLCs, but I think that the ABC test, this exemption is talking about a producer hypothetically, who is a 1099 producer who is getting paid as himself and is then paying out directly, which we would, I would, we would probably advise you to create and form a company first, not an LLC is what Lauren was saying, but that's a reason why. But again, a producer who's only, who's a self-employed person who doesn't have an LLC is kind of a unicorn in and of itself. Yeah, that's a great answer, AJ, which actually ties into this next one, which this next question that's up here and I'll, I'll actually join them together. So I think your answer nails it, AJ. Um, producers are oftentimes self-directed right? You hire them and then they're going to go execute the job for you really truly as a consultant. This is not always the case though. Sometimes you would tell a producer when to show up and where, in which case they can't pass the ABC test. So I would advise exactly what AJ said is you, you pay that producer either as a loan out whereby, this goes into this next question from an anonymous attendee here, but you either pay them as a loan out, meaning that they have their own entity uh, that can receive payment as a business, or you really make sure that when you hire a producer, you're just giving them this job and then they're going to execute it for you. If that's the case, there's a good chance you could get away with it. Again, there's still risk and 95% of our clients higher than that probably pay producers as employees as well. Yeah. Um, this leads into this next question though, which is, is it safe to assume that all crew that has a registered company related to the service that they are providing can be a 1099? Really, really good question. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, if you are paying another company, you're not paying an employee, you're paying another entity. However, it's important to state the IRS and your state government is very interested in accruing tax revenue. And so there is a rule around what is known as a disregarded entity. So we call these loan outs. This is where a single person, it's a single owned LLC, 
LLCs are unique vehicles because you can tax them those entities three different ways as a pass through entity, which basically gives you all the liability protections of an LLC, but you don't have to deal with the double taxation, taxing that LLC as its own corporation, and then you receiving a tax bill as well as a worker from that corporation. So basically this is getting a little bit into the mud, but in order for you to pay a loan out company compliantly, that LLC that you're paying must be designated as a entity that is taxed as a C or an S corporation. If it's taxed as a pass-through, the IRS is going to consider that a disregarded entity and you are supposed to pay those individuals as workers. Uh, and this is because essentially the IRS and the government wants their access to their payroll tax. So if you're gonna pay a loan out, it's really important to make sure that they've designated their tax status appropriately. Very in-depth answer. Um, and actually, Cameron, so you kind of mentioned this earlier, but then the, like the last question I see here is, is there any guidance on how to handle equipment rentals from an individual instead of a business referring to a kit fee? Should that be a W-2 scenario? How are kit fees taxed? A question we get a lot of rap book. It's a really good question. You do not need to pay payroll taxes against renting equipment. You only need to pay payroll taxes and workers' compensation against the employees that you're hiring. So in Wrapbook, we have what is known as a kit fee, where your worker is going to keep track of their time. That will have the payroll fees associated with it. It'll have the workers' comp associated with it. But the kit fee does not. And so that, that would be just paid out as miscellaneous income on a 1099. Correct. Great. Wonderful. And then uh, another, oh, another question. Yeah, I think we're going to keep this going. You know, we're, we budgeted about an hour. So we have about like about 10 minutes left. Do you guys have any questions that, that linger? And again, if you guys have a very specific question, it might be best to reach out to wrapbook.com slash contact where we can really give you like a more comprehensive view. Um, but this is a unique question. For a live stage show, our small troop of dancers who provide their own clothes, jewelry, makeup, negotiate amongst themselves on rehearsal times. They are paid far higher than minimum or standard rate as an incentive for level of talent. Why do, why do not, why we do not set the hours? We simply say finish the routine within a month and set your own schedule. Is that the 1099? Was that appropriate? I mean, you know, the person said, "Is a skirt the 1099 law?" Usually, when you say the word "skirt," it doesn't seem <laughs> to me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it goes back to what we were talking. This is very similar to the other question where, you know, you can try, um, you can, you can do it as a 1099. There could be consequences for, for doing that. They're not exempted from going through the test. Um, and you really have to look at the, when you're answering the questions, you have to look at it from the, from the perspective of the agency from California, from the IRS, not necessarily from your perspective, how can I really make this fit into what I need for it to fit into? So it, it, they could be, um, it could be a very expensive mistake. Great. Um, oh, more questions popping in. Um, is, if there is an ongoing project by project relationship with say an actor, what does that look like for them and the hiring entity? Are they being hired and fired each time a project is completed? Really interesting question. Yeah, so it's not hired and fired. So, you know, Wrapbook has a very unique way of managing our workers. So there's, workers can be on our Wrapbook platform without being associated with the project and they never have to terminate from our system. It makes it so much easier when someone comes in with a new project, they can select that worker. Good portion of their start work is already complete. All they'll need to do at that point is fill out maybe some additional start work that relates to that specific project. So the, when you think about hiring and terminating, it, it's a little bit different in our system, but it makes it in a much, much easier way. Um, Kirby Washington says, how long has the ABC test been in existence? So I believe the end of 2019 is when it was first introduced, passed in 2020, yes. a lot of exemptions. And like Lauren said, it's retroactive. So even though it's um, been around. 
Oh, sorry, we're I, saying. I, I think it is. I'm not sure if this question is the ABC test or if it's AB5. Oh, oh, you're right. I answered that as more AB5. How the ABC test is the worker classification test. Sorry, my goodness. Right, yeah. and that's the one from from the IRS, which has been around a bit longer um, than that has been. Um, I could look it up. It's probably about ten years or so that it's been uh, it's been around. Um, yeah, but it, no. Like, it, go ahead. Wasn't it Borello? That's the court case that established the ABC test. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Dylan Bell has a question. Um, just to clarify, is four percent of total employee budget a good amount to set aside on budgets if they are pitched to a client? Um, Cameron, you, you would probably have an answer that's on this. Way, that's low. Yeah, uh, that's unfor unfortunately, Dylan, that's much too low. Uh, I would say that you would be safe to budget around 21 to 22% for all wages to your employees and workers. So whatever the day rates are for all of your workers across your project, add 22% to that. Now, I want to share a really cool tool with you on wrapbook.com under our resources tab in the navigation, there's a button there that says estimate your payroll. And what this does is, is it will allow you to select the state that you're shooting in, you put in your estimate of payroll wages and it will give you the breakout line by line as to where those costs come from. And so that can be a very useful tool for your own budgeting, but it can also be a really useful tool so that you can justify to your clients why you're charging them this markup for the employee taxes. Um, that's very, very useful for many of our clients here at Wrapbook. Uh, and again, I'm so sorry that 4% is not going to be enough. <laughs> it looks like we just have some nice thank you messages from people. Um, someone said navigating worker status below the line has been a big part of the less than union job market. <laughs> and uh, that's a great, that's a great term for that. Um, yeah, um, I think, you know, people have more questions. There, there was one that I didn't answer live. And the question was, does Wrapbook do W-2 for the labor and 1099s for the kit fees all at once in an automated way? The answer to that is yes. So through your wrap, Wrapbook's very interesting, right? Because you would sign up as an employer, but you, some of you on this call might also work for other production companies. And Wrapbook understands that. So when you log in with Wrapbook, you have your own account that you can actually receive payments from, but then you can also use your account to become the administrator of your own company or the project coordinator on somebody else's company. And so there's this really interesting network effect and permission system built into the product today that allows you all of these different types of payments. So we can do 1099 contractor payments, we can do loan out payments, we can do employee payments. That's for you as the worker, like say maybe you're working on somebody else's set, but then maybe you want to spin up your own production company or your own feature film. Well, you can do that. You can create a company. You become the admin of that company through your wrap up profile. And then you can start onboarding other people and paying them compliantly as well. So the system is really robust. It's very considered to the production industry and all of these unique edge cases that really just apply to us here in this industry. Very true. Um, I think with that, let's wrap this up, guys. Um, thank you so much to Lauren and Cameron for jumping on and 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 just kind of diving into AB five and helping uh, helping these people. Um, are oh, got some nice some nice glowing uh, <laughs> nice glowing comments for you guys. But yeah, thank you guys for jumping on this. Um, again, if you have any questions or you think about it tomorrow, you're like oh my goodness, I have a very specific fringe case, or I just want to have a refresher on something. Definitely go to wrapbook.com slash contact. Tell us about your production company, the productions you're running. We'd love to see if we can help you um, and how we can, you know, 